Okay, so we're in the middle of the Gemara's discussions about the order of the blessings in the weekday Amidah. And um, we uh, put, uh, uh, we, we found ourselves, we sort of read this really quickly. Middle of, of 17 B3, left hand column. Um, about uh, the healing blessing that is in the eighth spot, the eighth blessing. So let's start from there. Okay, will somebody do us the honor of, of uh, reading the text, please? Gamara inquires, left-hand side, 17B3, middle of the column. Who's going to do that? Going once, going twice, going three times, four times. Five times, six times, seven times, eight times. Come on. Okay, now we'll try it again. Going once for a second time. Going twice for a second time. Going three times. Who's going to read? Come on. I'll read, even though you can't see me. Uh, we can see you fine. You have a capital M and an E and an R. And an yeah, L. I know. Okay. Well, I'm going to get a magnifying glass because this is a little small. Okay. Where are we starting? 17B3. Yeah. Left-hand column, middle of the column. The Gemara yeah. inquires, and why did they see fit to okay. say? All right. I see it. The blessing of healing. Yeah. And, and why did they... Wait a second. I want to get the microphone. Okay. And why did they... Uh, see fit to say the blessing of healing eighth. The Gemara answers, Rav Acha said, because the mitzvah of circumcision, which requires healing, is designated for the child's eighth day. Therefore, they placed it, the blessing of healing, eighth in the sequence of blessings. Okay, any comments on that? Okay. Does anybody uh, ever get at the end of their Seder to uh, who knows one, who knows two, who knows three? Sure. Sometimes people never make it that far. So, uh, you know, because it's like it's it's placed there at the very, very end, that and Chad Gadya. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, it, it, it gets uh, left out because it's, you know, four o'clock in the morning, it's already enough. So they don't do it. But if you do it, so we go, who knows one, and one is... What's one? Uh, What's the answer? Who knows one? Creation. No. One is God. Okay. One is Hashem. One is Hashem. One is Hashem. Above the heavens and the earth. Echad miyodeya. Echad Echad elokeinu. God, our almighty God is one. Shema Yisrael. Shem elokeinu Hashem echad. So there's only one one. And that's God. And then we go, who knows two? Who knows three? Who knows four? And we go up through 13. So who knows eight? And we Yachay say eight. Leda. Right. What? Yachay leda. No, that's months of birth, and that's nine. Huh. Right? Because we oh, have full term, a full term. Yimei, really yimei mila. Is, right. You may mila. So eight is the days for, for a circumcision. Right? If all things go well and everybody is healthy, then it's the eighth day mandated by the Torah. And, his, and the person's, uh, the baby's uh, uh, flesh shall be circumcised on the eighth day. So this is taken as a mitzvah mandating that it is the eighth day that the, that the Mila should happen. And that means that even on Shabbat, which is normally a time that we wouldn't do an operation, it's an operation, it's a medical procedure. Um, you're not allowed to, to uh, uh, do that on Shabbat. Nevertheless, Brit Mila, if it's uh, everything again, if everything is okay, then, um, and it's a natural birth, then we override Shabbat and we do Brit Mila and we do the circumcision because it's so important for it to be on the, ninth, on the eighth day. So last time we talked a little bit about eight 
being the number that goes past seven, obviously. And since seven is the, the, the number that includes all of creation, the fact that, that the world was created in seven days, seven Shabbat, and all of the sevens, the, the fact that we're in a seventh year, the sabbatical year, it's called the Shabbat year. So Shabbat is the seven, and Shabbat is this culmination by Yechulu HaShamayim Ba'aretz, right? The culmination of all creation of heaven and earth happens with the seventh day. So seven is the culminating, all-encompassing number. So eight is like this, you know, uh, um, what would be the opposite of anticlimax? The opposite of, you know, like super climax. It's like beyond the culmination is the breakthrough to eight. Um, when people uh, talk about the fact that Brit Mila happens on the eighth day, one of the things that they uh, point out is that this ensures that every male baby lives through a Shabbat before they get circumcised, right? Um, Shabbat, will, in, will they will encounter a Shabbat in their young life by the time they get circumcised, right? If the circumcision was on the sixth day, you could theoretically never, you know, not have Shabbat yet. So um, the eighth day is of course one day past seven and will always include those seven days. So eight is this beyond the natural culminating number. Um, what the, what the uh, Gemara says here, of course, is that having a Brit, because it's a medical procedure, because it's a wound of the, body, of the body, it's a cutting into the body, that assumes in the very mitzvah, it assumes healing, right? Because if it didn't assume healing, it would simply be torture. What's the difference between torture and brit milah? For some people who are against circumcision, there is no difference. There's the, the uh, you know, uh, um, inflicting this terrible pain and, and uh, mutilation on the body of an innocent, defenseless baby is considered barbaric by many, many people. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, Judaism struggles with, with uh, throughout history with people who are against circumcision um, you know, and with, with all kinds of arguments to bring to bear. And on the other side of it, Judaism has been practicing this for thousands and thousands of years. So far, we've been okay practicing this, this uh, practice. And part of it is, is because fundamental to the practice is the answer, is the, is the belief that it, the baby's gonna be okay, that this is gonna be fine, that the baby will recover and that the parents will recover and that anybody else who has been anxious about this, we're all gonna recover. So Brit Mila is of course the, the imposition of a uh, you know a mark on the body of this uh, you know unaware child by adults, um, but it is the imposition of that mark with the conviction that this uh, will be okay. That physically speaking, the people, uh, uh, the baby, and everybody else will heal. So Brit Mila has healing programmed in it. Hey, Wanda, hi. I'm waving to you. Can you see? Okay. So, um, so, so the Gemara says, therefore eight, the number eight is exactly where this blessing should be. Now, we've had discussions already more than once about the idea that this is trying to create a rationale for the order. It seems to me that as we begin to look at these examples, you know, we can be more or less convinced by them. But part of what the Gemara seems to be assuming is that we're also keeping track of these numbers. That when we make the blessing, we sort of have a sense of what blessing we're up to. Um, that's not, I don't think, common uh, consciousness, certainly not for me. So uh, it, it just seems to be an interesting uh, um, added feature to think about a little bit. Uh, when one prays, um, should this be a part of one's kavana? I, I just leave it out there for now. I don't have anything uh, to say more about that.
Rabbi? Yes. I just out of historical curiosity, I mean, so numerology and numbers have a lot of meaning even now for people and more so at that time. So, and it's especially for Jews and for, you know, and others too, like, but a lot of stock by numbers. So I would think it would actually, maybe it was more natural, especially then to maybe. think like every number is important. So the, what starts this whole conversation going? Maybe, maybe. Okay. Sherilyn. Um, there's scientific evidence that shows that also that the eighth day, um, the baby's clotting factor um, begins to take place and the mother's clotting factor is still in effect. So it's also a time of protection for most time of protection for the baby as well. Good, thank you. Good. Yeah, and, and you know, whatever the science we know about it, historically, we know we've been okay. We've been okay doing this. Okay, we continue. Merle, back to you. Okay, let me, let me get my, um, oh, there it is, okay. So, um, wait a second. Okay, so the, um, the Gemara answers, um, the, oh, I'm sorry, the Gemara inquires, and why did they see fit to say the blessing of the year's ninth? The Gemara answers, Rav Alexandri said, this blessing is directed against those who raise the prices of food unfairly, as it is written in uh, reference to this practice, break the strength of the of the wicked, break the sense of the wicked. And David, when he composed this verse, he included it in the ninth Psalm. Therefore, this blessing is also placed ninth. Okay. So this is a kind of a roundabout uh, um, uh, explanation. You really need to know a, a lot about the, um, you know, the, the texts of, of, of our tradition. You need to know that there's a certain ninth psalm that has a, that has a subject in it uh, about uh, uh, not not being uh, you know not liking the fact that people take advantage of poor people and drive up prices. Um, so you need to know that that's in the ninth psalm, and then you need to feel you know good about the fact that ah, and look at this wonderful connection. So in the ninth blessing, I will repeat the concern of the ninth psalm. And, uh, and, and bring this up as well. So, I mean, it's a, that's really assuming a lot of subtle knowledge, but let's go step by step. The first part of it is, is that, well, what's the blessing itself? The blessing, the blessing of years is a blessing which asks God to uh, make this a year of blessing, of abundance, right? Let it be a good year. And this is the year, this is the blessing where we actually change depending on whether we're in the rainy season or not. If we're in the rainy season, we say, let it be a year with a lot of good rain. That'll bring, make sure that, that, that everything will be, um, you know, uh, grow and, and be, be uh, uh, you know, fruitful and so on. When it's not the rainy season, then we say, you know, let, let everything be, you know, have benefited and let the dew also be uh, uh, sustaining the earth so that there'll be enough stuff that will be produced this year uh, um, so that the year will be a good year. Okay, David, you, you're pulling up a Sidur. Okay, you know what? So put yourself off mute, if you could, please. When you find that blessing, if you could read it out loud, that would be great. Weekday Amida. Mincha, Mariv, Shachri, it doesn't matter. Problem. It? The problem is I have it in the back of a... Uh, of a, uh, a All right. So be, bear with me for a second. Let me, let me, go, let me go get my, my Sidur because I'm I, in I, found it. I, found, uh, I found it. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. What do you got? So what do we got here? Let's see. Salah, Lefainu, Barech, Kalainu. 
Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. It's in, right, Peter, I don't have a translation. <laughs> what? You don't have a translation? No, I just, I'm working off the Hebrew. Um, All right. Hold on a second. I will read to you a translation. I, I have it also. Okay, go ahead. Lord our God, make this a blessed year. May its varied produce bring us happiness. Grant blessing to the earth. Satisfy us with its abundance and bless our year as the best of years. Praised are you, Lord, who blesses the years. Okay, good. So, so that's the that's the the overall like um, um, that's the overall theme. All of a sudden, now the Gemara says that this blessing is directed against those who raise the prices of food unfairly. Did anybody see that coming? No, that's a pretty uh, a pretty interesting uh, um, you know uh, claim here. What's the connection? What's what's going on here? Yeah, so Jenny. So I mean, it seems actually like okay. That's I, the connection is pretty obvious. You want everyone to be don't, able to don't enjoy. Don't assume anything is obvious. I mean, as far as, and we're talking about food, we want everyone to be able to enjoy this food that God has given us. So I can see where you can leave, but it does sound like someone had a personal pet peeve at that moment, or where like or their area was dealing with, you know, um, immoral uh, suppliers or something. It does sound like super personal at that moment to, to add this, and this is what it's about. Um, on the other hand, though, in fairness, it is a perpetual problem. Uh, we're going to face it right now in, in the US with inflation that's justified, not justified, et cetera. So, um, I mean, I guess it's fair. In the end, it's fair to put that in there. Yeah, and I think I think that, that uh, um, look, the, the the economic realities of life in general are not going to go away. We've, we've uh, been looking at uh, Torah portions that talk all about the fact that um, uh, people struggle. Um, we, we, we're in the middle of a, of a sabbatical year. At the end of the sabbatical year, debts that you haven't been able to repay get canceled. The Torah recognizes that from the outset, that they're going to be economic inequalities and people who are poor are going to be in trouble unless they get extra help. Um, people will lose their, their, their assets. People will lose their estates. People will lose, you know, the, the repo man is going to come around and just clean up because poor people will be uh, put in, in terrible situations that they have no recourse uh, except to, uh, to take um, you know, high interest rates or, or sell off their, their land and things like that. Um, and uh, we've, we've had these uh, uh, in the Torah portions and in, in prophetic portions, we've read about it. People that took advantage of, of poor people, <coughs> people become enslaved. They become, in, you know, indentured servants because they, they can't, uh, um, um, you know, uh, satisfy their, their, uh, their lenders. Um, so we had, you know, Yovel this past Shabbat as well. So this, there's the Torah thousands and thousands of years ago already recognizes that there is a power differential between the rich and the poor and that the rich cannot be trusted to use their power generously and uh, circumspectly um, all on their own. The, the, you know, the, the idea that, that capitalism is, is going to be self-regulating and so on um, assumes that that uh, somehow or other the, the, the forces of, uh, of of society all end up balancing out and it's just not true. Um, it's not an even playing field. So so uh, um, people need to be uh, helped when they don't have and people need to be checked when they do have. So what this uh, rabbinic uh, statement here, this Gemara is saying is, if we would just read that blessing on face, you know, on its face, it sounds like a, a blessing that just basically saying, God, make it, make nature be abundant. Let it, let it be a good year for, for, for me, for us, for everybody. It's a very neutral kind of uh, um, idea that, you know, hopefully there'll be enough. And naturally speaking, 
people think about that in terms of their own self-interest. Um, so it's a good year if it's good for me. It's a bad year if it's bad for me. What the Gemara now says is a good year is something that we pray for, not for me necessarily. I could be, you know, a, a, you know, a very well-off person. It's a, it, we need it to be a good year for the poor people because the poor people are food insecure. The poor people are economically vulnerable um, in, in, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of a chain reaction situation. Um, you know, look at what happened. I don't know, you know it, it just, it was so sad for me. I was, I was riding around. Most of the time I try to avoid listening to the news and watching the news and so on. I was riding around right after uh, the massacre in Buffalo happened. So terrible, it's a terrible tragedy. Uh, clearly, you know, it's a mass murder. What a, what a, what a, a horrible, horrible tragedy. But the, the ramifications of that were, or one of the ramifications was an economic one. The store was closed. The store where this murder, the supermarket uh, where this murder took place then had to be closed down because it was a murder scene. So that's legitimate. You, the, they, they need to comb the place for evidence and for whatever. There are legal things that need to be taken care of. So the store was closed. And you know, for it's going to be closed. It was closed. I don't know if it opened, reopened already. I didn't follow, but it was going to be closed for days. That was the only food <clears throat> store in that whole neighborhood. That was the only place where the people who lived all around that for miles could access buying their food without having to take a taxi or or having a car or whatever it is and schlepping to some other place. It's a little bit reminiscent, obviously not to the same extent, but you know, here in, in wonderful, well-off, successful Montclair in the fourth ward, I'm, on, I'm right at the border. I'm in the third ward, right you know, a block away from the fourth ward of, of Montclair where Lackawanna Plaza is. And, and it's been whatever it is, years and years that there hasn't been a supermarket at Lackawanna Plaza. And people in the fourth ward have no real, they have a couple of grocery stores. They have a, you know, so it's not exactly as terrible, but it's pretty terrible. So the, the, the lack of, of services, of resources, um, we saw this in COVID. We saw this all the time. It impacts the poor. So what the Gemara here is reminding us is, is when we pray for a good year, we're actually praying in the way this, the Gemara puts it, it's like a one-two punch. We're praying so that the poor not suffer unduly because <laughs> if they suffer unduly, there's going to be miserable SOBs out there that are going to take advantage of it. And they're going to, and they're going to say, sure, I'll sell you, a, a, you know, a, a, a gallon of milk. You know, give me half your week's salary. Um, and of course, the market will bear it. That's, the, that's what the market will bear. So the, so, so the Gemara here sort of like, you know, I think it really is a very sharp kind of uh, surprising uh, uh, insight saying, think about this beyond your own self-interest. Think about when you pray for, a, for a, an abundant year, pray for the sake of two things, for the sake of the poor being able to have what they need and for the sake of those people who would be led into the temptation of manipulating those people not to be able to do it. So we're actually saving all of those, uh, um, you know, cutthroat dealers from doing the sins that they otherwise might do. So that, that's a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a nice way of, of not letting people uh, become as as rough and as as they as they might be, I was I was uh, look personally speaking, I don't know if it's a secret. I am very prejudiced against the hats. Um, I uh, I'm not impressed with the track record of uh, of of the people that that uh, you know have the economic power. 
um, you know, they, I don't think that they've shown that, that, they, that as smart as they are, that they actually create, can create a system that's good for everybody. Um, I was just reading a, a, an article about a, a, a Jewish ritual art artist. In other words, an artist that does ritual objects for synagogues and, and so on. He does, you know, the, you know, an ark door. He's a sculptor. He does, you know, uh, eternal lights. He does all kinds of things. And he, and he has to move out of uh, Chelsea. He's been in Chelsea for 50 years and he can't afford it anymore. And uh, he's 81 and he's still working. He's still, he's still an artist. He's still producing his art. He gets commissions from synagogues and so on. He said during COVID, obviously there was, there was a, 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 he got hit real hard. It wasn't good for him. But here's a guy who's apparently still lives off the sweat of his brow. And he said he can't sustain it anymore. And he says, my, my building and my, he's got a loft. Uh, I think he's got the ground floor because it sounded like he had the, the backyard for, for some of his sculpture. But he said, the place is just, you know, crawling with investment bankers and I can't, I can't handle it anymore. Um, so um, it's, it's uh, you know, that's what our, our Gemara is saying, that it's not so innocuous. You know, economic well-being and, a, and an abundant harvest is not just to be taken for granted as good, as good for, for everyone. We need to make it good for everyone. Um, and uh, when we make our, <laughs> we recite our blessings in the Amida, they're always in the plural. It's not God, forgive me. God, give me wisdom. It's give us wisdom. Give us forgiveness, right? Um, give us healing. Then you can add in, oh, and by the way, I know so-and-so, can you please include that so person in, your, in, you know, in, in giving healing and so on. But it's always plural. It's always the entire community. So when we want this good year to happen, we want it to happen for everybody, for everybody. Okay. Um, Jen, you wanted to say something? Just a, a quick comment on my prior tradition. This, after when you're saying this about not tempting these wealthy into doing this, this is the first time I think I've understood why in the Our Father we say, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> it's like it, it always been kind of a weird phrase to me before, but now I get it. Thank you. Well, actually, I, we, we're packing up stuff here in the house. And uh, over the years, there used to be, I don't, I don't know how much of, it's, of a thing it is now, there used to be this thing that was just like bulldog named Zelda. So I don't know if anybody uh, is aware of it. It became a whole, it became a whole thing. So there were these books that were produced. So people, you know, Zelda is blessed with a wonderful name, but she's cursed with the idea that this name is so unique that people always think that anything with the name Zelda in it, she has to get, she has to get it, you know? So when there was a, you know, a biography of Zelda Fitzgerald, she got like 80 copies of the, of the, of the biography, you know, and so on. So, so, there's, so I just saw there's this little book that was sitting in our bathroom, Zelda Wisdom, right? So what it is, is this, this bulldog and then it's dressed up, you know, in different kinds of costumes and so on with its, you know, a bulldog face. And then there's a little pithy little thing. So the little thing that just caught my eye is you know, don't lead me not into temptation. I can find it just just fine by myself. You know, so you don't have, I don't need your help. I'll 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 find the temptation all by myself. So yes, that's the uh, that's the reality. Okay, um, so break the strength of the wicked. Let's look at twenty nine, and then let's look at thirty because thirty is going to be an interesting little uh, wrinkle in this. Can you see it, Merle? Can you see? Yeah, Merle? I'm looking. I'm yeah, twenty nine. Um, Psalms fifteen. Uh, Psalm ten fifteen. I mean ten fifteen. Okay, the wicked of this verse are specifically those who drive up food prices. This is borne out by another verse in the same psalm, which states, "He lurks in hiding like a lion in his lair. He lurks to seize the poor." Normally, thieves target the rich, not the poor. By specifying the poor, the verse indicates that it refers to those who drive up food prices, who 
whose main intention is to take advantage of the poor. The entire text of the verse quoted in the Gemara reads, break the power of the wicked and the evil one and the evil one. You will search for his wickedness and find it not. David entreats God to grant an abundance of crops for in that way, the power of those who drive up the food prices will be broken and it will be impossible uh, to even find this wicked practice. Likewise, in the blessing of the years, we pray for an abundance of produce so that the wicked will be unable to charge high food prices. Right. Because it doesn't, we should add into that blessing and please break the monopolies, right? Please, please break the power of agri, agribusiness. But we didn't, we didn't get that far. Okay, so now at the beginning of note 29, it says that this verse comes from Merle, what does it say? Wait, oh. let me, uh, the verse 29, they say it comes from um, a psalm, a Which psalm, psalm 10. Psalms 10, 15. So 15. The verse 15, Psalm 10. What does the Gemara say? Which psalm is it in? It says it's in Psalm 10. In the note, it says it's in Psalm 10. What does oh, the Gemara no. say? Uh, and David, when he composed this verse, he included it in... Wait a second. I'm just having of, trouble finding things with my... Um, top of 17B3 in the text. Oh, in the text. Okay. Um, wait, are, are we at the blessing of the years? Or yes. Are we at, yes. Yeah. Okay. And why did they see fit to say the blessing of the ingathering of exiles? After no, 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 no. Before, no. The, right, it says break the strength of the wicked. Right. And David, when he composed this verse... This is at the top right-hand column, 17B3. Yeah. Top line. Oh, uh, break the strength of the wicked. And David, when he composed this verse, he included it in the ninth psalm. Oh. In the ninth psalm. Ninth psalm. Therefore, and we, and we have our note life. that this is not Psalm 10. Yeah. So now look at note 30. Okay. That'll explain the mystery. Okay. Although, according to the common reckoning, this psalm is the 10th. The Gemara regards it as the ninth. Uh, Tosafos cites Gemara, which states, 10a. Yeah, Barakos um, 10a, which states that the first two paragraphs of Psalms are considered one psalm. Consequently, the psalm referred to here is actually the ninth. However, Rashi writes in the first two that the first two paragraphs are separate psalms. It would appear that according to Rashi, the psalm discussed here is reckoned to be the ninth because the ninth and tenth paragraphs are considered one psalm. Okay, so we have a little uh, window into um, a, a question about how we count psalms and how we divide up psalms um, into uh, uh, their discrete units. And this is actually, um, uh, there's a difference between Jewish and Christian traditions about counting the Psalms and how you break them up. Um, and it's, uh, uh, we see here that even within the Jewish tradition, it's not clear how we break up the Psalms. We have a tradition that there are 150 Psalms, but when does one Psalm begin and when Psalm end is not always clear. You know, 99% of the time it's clear, but not, a, not, not always. Um, a, 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 no, an example that I can think of that I know of is, for instance, Psalm one eight, Psalm one uh, seventeen, sixteen, fourteen, thirteen. I don't remember the number of it, um, but it's one of the Psalms of Hallel, and it goes Hallelujah. <laughs> So it's something like two verses. Praise God, all of the nations of the earth, because God has been so mightily good to every to us, and uh, and uh, you know God is truly good. The next verse is. Hashem, I praise God because God's love is forever and ever and ever. It's infinite. So does that praise God? Does that belong to the previous lines? Or is it a separate psalm? 
we have it as a separate sign. Um, in Christian tradition, if I'm not mistaken, that short psalm is too short. And it's considered together with the next lines, the next four verses, as one psalm together. So how we divide up the psalms um, is uh, sometimes a matter of disagreement. And here we have, you know, cer certainly the Gemara is explicit. As far as the Gemara is concerned, this is the ninth psalm, not the tenth psalm. Um, how we get it to be the ninth psalm is either we combine the first two psalms of the, of, of the, of the book of Psalms, or we combine the ninth and tenth psalms. Um, different approaches. Um, our approach is neither. Our approach is the first and second psalm are two separate psalms, and the ninth and tenth psalm are two separate psalms, and therefore we don't have this as the ninth psalm. It's the tenth psalm. So the whole Gemara's uh, numerology part doesn't hold up. But the, the lesson, the economic lesson, definitely holds up. The economic lesson is definitely important. Um, okay, so now we continue. Next. The Gemara uh, inquires. Yeah, the Gemara inquires, and why did they see fit to say the blessing of the ingathering of exiles after the blessing of the years? The Gemara answers. Okay, so what's that blessing? What's the blessing of the ingathering of exiles? Okay, does somebody have it? I'll read it for you. I have to, again, I have to open up the Sidur. I found my Sidur. It's not so, not so easy to find these things these days because everything is in its different boxes here. Um, hold on a second. So, here it goes. Right? Sound the great shofar announcing our freedom. Raise the banner signaling the ingathering of our exiles. The sanes, the kabates galuyotenu. The kapsenu yachad mearba kanfota arets. And bring us together from the four corners of the earth. You abound in blessings, eternal one. Me kabates nidchei amo Yisrael. Who gathers the dispersed of your people, Israel. Okay, so that's the blessing. So it is the idea of redemption in the sense of bringing everybody from the exile back together. Let's hear that final shofar blow and bring everybody back home. Of course, we just read in the Torah reading yesterday that on Yovel, we, we blow a shofar and everybody goes back home, but that's within the land. And now we apply this idea also, <laughs> let there be a shofar of redemption sounded, and then all over the world, let, let the Jewish people be able to come back home. So why is this blessing of the ingathering of exiles placed after the blessing that we should have a good year? Kamara answers. The Kamara answers, for it is written, you mountains of Israel sprout forth your branches and give forth your fruit to my people Israel, and for they are close to returning. The Gemara explains why okay, this. So, so we have here. So, so yeah. So we have the, the standard idea being, without any explanation, we found a verse where these two themes are put together, right? Where the theme of abundance of the land and of the harvest is is linked to the ingathering of the exiles, to the redemption of the people of Israel. So if we think about that just for a second, again, the verse in its context is saying that because of the ingathering of exiles, because of the redemption, therefore let the earth sprout forth more abundance. Let the earth respond <laughs> during this, this, this period of, of uh, mir miraculous redemption. But in our order of prayer, when we have the blessing for the, for the, uh, um, the goodness of the year, which comes first, we're not tying it to redemption. <coughs> On the contrary, we're saying, you know what? There's, it's a tough world out there and there's a lot of people that take advantage of other people. Let it be a good world so that people won't minimally, minimally um, hurt each other, right? Like, like we say for doctors, first do no harm. Then we'll worry about, about all the good stuff. So <coughs> the, the, uh, the verse talks about a, a wonderful year in the context of redemption. But we don't have that redemption context first. If we would have put the redemption first, 
then the meaning of the blessing for the good year would have changed completely, right? It would have been part of our vision of some beautiful future after the redemption happens, let there be a good year of abundant harvest. No, what we're saying is first, let there be a good harvest now when there's no redemption. And then let there be a redemption. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, the Gemara explains why the blessing for restoration of justice is next. Okay, what does that blessing say? So it says like this. Hashiva shoftenu kivari shona. Restore the judges to us as in the beginning. Ve'yoatzenu kivatchila. And the wise counselors like it was initially. Remove from us all sour, sorrow and anguish. May you alone, eternal one, with kindness and compassion rule over us. May you find our cause righteous. May you vindicate us. You abound in blessings, eternal one, the sovereign who loves justice and compassion. Right? Melech ohev staka umishpat. You love justice and compassion. So please bring us back the judges the good judges from the beginning, not the judges that we have right now. Okay, this is a, certainly a very, very uh, uh, pertinent blessing to be recited uh, on, you know, in, in this time. Um, so much of the administration of, of justice depends not on just a, just a judicial system, but on who the judges are, who the judges are, what they actually believe in, what do they see, how much are they capable of taking into their considerations. If the judges don't care about social injustice, then they simply can, you know, you know, throw the law by, you know, by the book, by the book at anybody and everybody, and uh, they think that they're administering justice, and they're actually just destroying uh, uh, justice. So um, we want a restoration of justice, and God loves justice. That's what God wants, but God loves it. That's great. But in the end, it's in our hands whether we're going to administer justice or not. Okay, so the Gemara asks, why is this placed in the, as the next blessing up? And once the exiles have been assembled, judgment will be visited on the wicked. As it is said, and I will turn my hand upon you and purge away your dross as with lie. And in the next verse it is written, and I will restore your judges as at first. Okay, so that's, in other words, we see that now the prayer that we have, Hashiva Shaftenu Kavar Yishana, is actually a paraphrase of a verse which says, V'yashiva Shaftayich Kavar Yishana. So we're praying to God, you said, you promised us that you would do this. Please, I've asked you, I asked you last night, I'm asking you this morning. I'm going to ask you in the afternoon. I'm going to ask you tonight. Please do this now, not later. Not when the ultimate redemption happens. When the ultimate redemption happens, then the wicked will be defeated. That's great. Well, how long do we have to wait? Can you please do this now? If you love justice, what are you waiting for? Right? If you love fairness, fair judgment, then we need you to help us now. Right? Um, so this is, again, the order of the verse says that this is dependent on the redemption, on the ultimate redemption. The way we put it into our prayer is we want to hasten the redemption. We want to push it. We want to say, okay, we want redemption now, or we want justice now. Maybe you don't have to put it off until everything is perfect. Right? Um, to a certain extent, that's really the argument of, of, a, of a conservative uh, uh, judicial philosophy. Stop pushing, stop, stop pushing the envelope. You're just going to cause social upheaval because people aren't ready for it yet. Let things work out eventually when everybody, you know, gets the idea across that, that, that everybody is equal, then everybody just by themselves will be able to, you know, vote for uh, equal rights and you won't have to shove it down their throat. Um, so it's this idea of, okay, eventually, you know, wait for, wait for the Messiah to come. Um, and uh, um, what our blessings say is we don't want to wait for the Messiah to come because there are people suffering right now in the here and now. 
So please either bring this redemption that we've been hearing about so much, or at least do a little bit of redemption, right? Do an atchalta de gula, do the beginning of redemption now. Okay, next blessing. Kamara explains why the blessing regarding the heretics is next. What is that blessing? So here's the way it, it reads. Let the hopes of those who defame us, um, or another interpretation is informers, those who are informers, uh, be dashed. May all wickedness be instantly frustrated. May all your enemies be quickly cut off. Um, root out, subdue, break, and humble the arrogant speedily in our day. Some readings, some texts have root out, subdue, break, and humble the regimes of the arrogant, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a government that's out there that's, that's uh, causing havoc, murder, and, and destruction. Let that government not succeed. Speedily in our day, uh, you abandon blessings, eternal one, who defeats enemies and humbles the arrogant. So this is a blessing against um, a specific kind of wickedness, a wickedness that imposes itself with oppression and with uh, 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 destruction upon others. Um, take him out. Now, the Gemara's, uh, uh, the way the editorial comment here um, characterizes it is regarding the heretics. So we'll have to come back to that. Why, if I just read you that text, what I read to you was people who defame us, people who are wicked, people who are, uh, uh, you know, awful. How does that translate to heretics? Well, we'll see. Okay, let's see the Gemara first. Okay. Um, and once judge, well, the Gemara ex explained. So, and once judgment has been visited on the wicked, the transgressors will cease to exist and the presumptuous sinners included with them. As it is said, and the destruction of the transgressors and sinners shall be together and those who forsake God shall cease to exist. Okay. So the, um, again, this is a completion of the idea of how a redemptive um, era will come about and what will the world look like when redemption happens. And in the, in the text of the Gemara, again, what we have is Rishaim, Poshim. Rishaim is wicked people. Poshim is people who are criminals on purpose. Zaydim is hardened, awful, disgusting uh, um, uh, oppressors, right? Um, we have them as the opposite. We have it in Al Hanisim when we celebrate in Hanukkah that God helped us defeat uh, the, the uh, Antiochus and, and all of those terrible uh, Hellenistic oppressors. They are Zaydim because they are Bizadon totally on purpose, totally with malice aforethought, um, trying to, you know, to do terrible things. So um, they'll disappear. We have um, Psalm 104, which we recite uh, um, traditionally on Rosh Chodesh. It says at the very end of the Psalm, the Psalm is a beautiful, wonderful picture of um, the harmony of everything in, in creation. Um, the animals and human being and the sky and, and, and nature, everything, it's terrific, it's beautiful. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a breathtakingly wonderful psalm. And then at the end of the psalm, there's this a little bit sour note. And it says, Yitamu chata'im min ha'aretz urishaim odeinam barchi nafshi et Hashem. So Baruch Hashem Hashem is the beginning of the psalm. Oh, my soul, bless the eternal one. Right? So, and then it ends. Baruch Hashem, oh, my soul, bless the eternal one. And the whole psalm, again, 98% of it is, oh, you created the world. You wrapped yourself in light. The animals go out. They chirp in the trees, the birds, the 
the, the whales in the ocean and, and, and human beings go out and, they, and, they, and they're happy, you know, whistling while they work, everything is great. And then it gets at the end of the, and it says, May all of the, the uh, sinners disappear from the earth. And no more wicked people, right? Marchi nafshi, bless my soul. So it's, a, it's a, you know, some people read that and, and it's jarring. You know, how did these evil people get thrown into this psalm, which is this utopian, beautiful picture of, uh, of everything, uh, you know, being perfect. And uh, there's a famous uh, uh, story. I say it's famous. Um, that it's in, it's in the Gemara. That um, Rabbi Meir, I think, it was not, I can't remember all the details. I think it's Rabbi Mayer. He was, he lived in a tough neighborhood. I've told this story before. And it was, a, it was an awful neighborhood and it was under the thumb of gangs of, of uh, uh, people that made everybody's life miserable. They preyed on people. They, they harassed people. They stole, they hurt people. And Rabbi Mayer uh, couldn't stand it. And he prayed to God, may they be all wiped out. And his wife heard him say that. And his wife said to him, it doesn't say yitamu chut im min haaretz. In Psalm 104, it doesn't say may the sinners be, uh, uh, you know, never exist, you know, completely disappear from the earth. It says chataim, sins, the sins should disappear. You should pray that these people not sin. You shouldn't pray that these people should suffer and, and disappear. You should pray that their evil should disappear, that, should, that they should turn their life around. And it, that's what the meaning of that is, that there should be no more evil out there ruining the beauty of the world. And uh, the story goes, and that's sort of mayor took that to heart and he started trying to have a good influence on these gang members and they all did tshuva and then uh, the, the neighborhood got gentrified and everything was happy. And of course, then the poor people couldn't afford to live there anymore. And, uh, you know, it's a, I'm just kidding. Um, so, I mean, I'm not really kidding, but, but it's not in the story. Anyway, so that, that's the way it got turned around. So that's part of this question, right? When we're praying for the defeat of evil, how much do we really personalize it and say, you see that person, that's evil, defeat this person. You know, um, I, I unabashedly want Putin to be eliminated from the scene. This guy, as far as I'm concerned, is the embodiment right now, he's a force of evil. And I don't believe that this guy is gonna do tshuva. Um, he needs to be neutralized somehow, physically eliminated from any powerful options that he has to cause havoc and, 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 and terrible things in the world. Um, but in general, when you're comfortable and when you don't have those kinds of imminent uh, threats upon you, then, then basically what you can say is, no, I just wish that people would get their act together and not, uh, you know, not have wickedness uh, be part of their uh, uh, behavior, right? You know, love the, the sinner, hate the sin. Um, it's a very uh, hard uh, balancing act to, to have. Um, Psalm, Psalm 112 is a little bit like that. Psalm 112 is a psalm that um, we have a custom in our family to sing it Friday night. It's the counterpart to Eshet Chayel. So Eshet Chayel is the uh, end of Proverbs, chapter 31. You know, Eshet Chayel, so, oh, a woman of valor. She's so precious, more precious than rubies. She does all these good things. She's so righteous. She's so generous. She's so wise, she's so thoughtful, her whole family is, is uh, taken care of by her and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, it, she's uh, a person who is God-fearing and, and uh, she should be praised, you know, to the skies. So that's the Eishat Chayel. So there's a, a very, you know, uh, widespread custom to sing that Friday night. Um, we added a kind of an egalitarian uh, uh, compliment to that, Psalm 112, <laughs> sing the praises of a righteous man. 
And with the same characteristics, he's also he's generous, he's nice, he takes care of his family. It's all, you know, very much parallel. Um, and actually both of them, both of those texts follow the Aleph Bet. Eishet Chayel follows the Aleph Bet and uh, Psalm 112 uh, follows the Aleph Bet, except that Psalm 112 at the end goes, um, um, it says, you know, uh, she, um, it says, it says, peace on us and love you. Um, um, it goes, peace on us and love you. I don't know what. Carnal Torah, but Rasha Yereva Chaas, Shina Biacharot Benamas. Right? The wicked person will see this and will get angry and he will gnash his teeth and they will melt away. So, um, so there's this, again, including the wicked person in this picture of this beautiful, blissful, righteous uh, family situation, social situation. And then it gives it, uh, sticks it to the wicked. So when you read it, it could be again, like, what do we need that for? And in fact, in many uh, places, I've seen them take out those verses because it's too jarring. So they just, they just don't quote the whole psalm. They do a selective quotation. And the rest of it is very nice. And they just keep everything very, very pleasant. So like Walt, Walt, the Walt Disney approach to Torah. And, uh, but the, the, another way to look at it is also a kind of a Walt Disney approach where a lot of times what we've seen, you know, there's this, you know, the bad guy whose schemes are thwarted and then at the end, when it's a happy ending, we have a little, you know, shot over to the, to the, you know, the bad guy going, curses, foiled again, <laughs> right? And, and uh, that's part of the satisfaction. Part of the satisfaction is the defeat of evil. Um, so um, that's what the Psalm has. The Psalm has that kind of thing, like, you know what's going to be really the best revenge against the wicked is for them to watch that they couldn't make evil triumph, that they, that they couldn't pull off their schemes, their manipulations, their oppression, right? That's the best uh, uh, punishment against them. So that's, that's uh, um, one way to look at this defeat of evil um, phenomena and prayer. Okay. Um, any comments, further comments? Oh, I'll just may say one thing. Whenever I used to see that as a kid, it took me years to understand that when the, when the bad guy went curses, that that was the way the cartoon people were saying that he's actually saying curses, but they're not allowed to say the curses because it's, you know, it's a child's show. So he can't say all the expletives. And so he says curse. I never knew that until I was, you know, until I was like 70 years old. And I finally realized that that's what they was, was saying was that he's actually saying curses, but he can't say the curses. So he says curses. Um, did everybody know that except me? No, I know that. I did not know that. I, okay. I thought he was, he was giving out curses. Like I curse you and curse you and just general. Oh, that's what it really is. What it really is, is they're saying, He's really saying all of these, you know, four letter words and terrible things that we can't publish on, you know, on a, on a children's show. So they just say curse it is. Yeah. All right. Um, we're on 17B4. Okay. The Gemara explains why the blessing for the righteous is next. Okay, what's that blessing? Oh, we never explained the other thing. So why does the editorial comment say the, the Gemara explains why the blessing regarding the heretics is next? Did we see the word heretic? Do you see the word heretics? I don't see the word heretics. Do you see the word heretics? Oh, in the blessing, no. In the blessing that we talked about the wicked people. No. So the answer is because there are texts that say not those who slander us, but there are texts that seem to be earlier texts that say to the heretics, there shall be no hope. 
So this is, um, and according to some, uh, this is the extra blessing that was added to the 18 blessings, because now we have 19 blessings. So some people think this was the extra blessing and that it was put in because of internecine uh, struggles within the Jewish community where certain uh, heretical groups, could it be early Christianity? It's not clear. Um, were involved in positioning themselves with the authorities, you know, and, and informing on uh, the other group uh, as being, on, you know, not loyal and trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, foment rebellion and so on. So this blessing was put in as a kind of a fight against not evil in general, but the evil people that are actually harassing and uh, attacking us. Um, from within our own community who are um, heretics, right? Who don't believe in what we believe in, but they wanna, they wanna create something else. Um, in, in, the, uh, you know, in the time of early Christianity, early Christianity wasn't the only other group of Jewish people that had other ideas about how the Jews should respond to, uh, to the, you know, the cracking up of the world as they knew it right before the destruction of the temple and right after the destruction of the temple. So some people think that that blessing was specifically targeted uh, to uh, um, refer to them. And therefore, I mean, what's the point? Why can't we just have a general blessing against evil people? The answer is that then the heretics wouldn't come to shul because the heretics wouldn't want to say a blessing that would curse themselves. So therefore they would be separated out of the community. And this was a sifting out process that was uh, uh, undertaken to be able to make the synagogue a place that was the home for only, you know, uh, our, our gang and not, and not anybody else, right? So there was a, a, a struggle for the social uh, um, power uh, to be exerted over the community. Who is going to be in and who is going to be out. All right. The next blessing. So okay. here's, what it, here's what it says in the Siddur. Allah tzadikim v'yala chasidim v'yala ziknei am chabet Yisrael, etc. May your compassion, yehemun arachamech hashem. May your compassion, the eternal one, our source of almighty strength, flow to the righteous, to the pious, to the leaders of the people of Israel or to the elders of the people of Israel, the remnant of the sages, Pleitatso Frehem, the remnant of their scribes, the righteous converts, and all of us. May all those who trust in your name be truly rewarded and may our share be among them so that we never be shamed for trusting in you. You abound in blessings, eternal one, Promise and support for the righteous, right? Mishan umivtach, right? Or you could say the support and the security of the righteous, right? The righteous can lean on you, God. So take good care of them. So this is a prayer for the welfare of the righteous. Why does that come next? The Gemara explains, top of 17 before. Okay. <clears throat> and once the transgressors perish, the horn of the righteous will be exalted. As it is written, all the horns of the wicked I will cut off. Exalted shall be the horns of the righteous. And the righteous converts are included with the righteous. As it is said, uh, you shall rise in the presence of an old person and honor the presence of a sage. And next to it, scripture states, when a convert dwells among you. Okay. okay. Right. So right after that is that you should also love the convert as yourself. So therefore, we see that the converts are totally included within the righteous community of Israel. OK, next. Next. Yeah. OK. Um, the Gemara. Ex oh, oh, and yeah, the Gemara explains why the blessing for Jerusalem is next. What's that blessing? You might ask. Let me answer. The answer is, right? In your mercy, return to your city, Jerusalem. Dwell there as you have promised. 
rebuild it permanently, speedily in our day. May you soon establish the throne of David in its midst. You abound in blessings, eternal one who rebuilds Jerusalem. Okay, so a blessing for uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Clearly, you don't make a blessing like that, or maybe it's not so clear, but it seems to be clear. And when a Jerusalem is all built up, you make that blessing after Jerusalem has been destroyed. So timing wise, this blessing uh, you know, would, would not have been written um, while Jerusalem was a thriving city during second temple times. It would have to be written after Jerusalem was uh, um, you know, uh, attacked. Okay, the Gemara explains. Uh, the Gemara explains. Wait a second. Okay. Did I do? Did I do the one that? Let's ends start right there. Let the, the Gemara explains why the blessing for Jerusalem. Oh, why the? I'm sorry. Okay. And where will the horn of the righteous be exalted in Jerusalem? As it is said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those who love you will be serene. Okay. So it it follows since we're in this redemptive mode, uh, the world is getting cleaned out. The righteous are finally able to live in peace. Where will they come to live in peace? In the city of peace, right? Yerushalayim literally means the city of peace. So this will be now the place, the home, where uh, everyone will be able to, to come um, in peace, in security, and in joy. Of course, that's the whole idea of the pilgrimage festivals, right? Even before there is a redemption, a final redemption, coming to the central place, to coming to Jerusalem. Everybody's supposed to come to Jerusalem, the city of peace. This is where you're eating your ma'aser sheni. This is where you're bringing your sacrifices to God. This is where you're, uh, you're celebrating with you know, your Paschal lamb with all of your family and friends. The idea is bringing everybody to the <coughs> central place. Okay. Next. Okay. Uh, the Gemara explains why the blessing for the reinstatement of the Davidic kingdom is next. And once Jerusalem is built, the kingdom of David will come. As it is said... 18A1, you know, we made it. Okay. As it is said, um, afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek Hashem, their God, and King and David, their king. Okay, so, so if we look at the two blessings we see that they're intimately linked, right? The blessing for Jerusalem says, in your mercy, return to your city, Jerusalem, dwell there as your promise, rebuild the city permanently, speedily in our day. May you soon establish the throne of David in its midst. So already the throne of David is mentioned in the Jerusalem blessing. And then we have the next blessing is, et semach David avdacha mehirat hatzmiach, cause the shoot of your servant David to flourish. May the honor of the house of David be raised up with the coming of your deliverance, for we await your triumph each day. You abound in blessings, eternal one, who causes salvation to flourish. Matzmiach Karen Yeshua. So we already mentioned David in the previous blessing, right? May you establish the throne of David in its midst. So what's the need for this extra blessing? Already in the Jerusalem blessing, Jerusalem is established, it's rebuilt, it's wonderful. The throne of David is reestablished in Jerusalem. So haven't we touched all bases? What's the additional prayer of etzemach David Avdecha Meheirat Hatzmiach? What's the additional uh, um, uh, need for that blessing? Oh, am I supposed to read now? No, I'm asking a question about what you already read. Oh. I'm asking uh, the group. What's the sense of this? So I'm going to read to you. I don't, by now you've heard we're going to be um, bringing a new Sidur for use in um, the synagogue. The Leif Shalem series that uh, started with the Machsor that we adopted a number of years ago. Um, also has a weekday sidur, which we don't have, but we also, but they also created a Shabbat and festival sidur, um, and we have that. 
and that's coming. That's going to be officially uh, initiated for use in our uh, shul on June 18th. So stay tuned. Um, and I'm going to read to you the note that they write on this blessing of, um, they call it messianic hope, cause the shoot of your servant David to flourish. What is this Tzemach David Avdecha? This is the Biatza Choter Megeza Yishai. This is the Isaiah, Isaiah's vision that eventually the Messiah will come as a shoot coming out of the uh, um, root of Yishai, who was uh, um, uh, David's father, right? So this is the, the messianic vision at the end of days that there will be this Messiah and the, the dynasty of uh, David will be restored. So this is the note that they have. This was the last bracha to be added to the Amida. So according to this theory, I mentioned before that, that the heretic blessing was assumed by some scholars to be the 19th blessing that was added to the 18th. Here we have a different theory that this is the blessing that was added. This was the last bracha to be added to the Amidah, bringing its total number of blessings to 19 instead of the original 18. It was added in Babylonia, where the exilarch, the head of the Jewish community in exile, right, traced his lineage to the exiled house of David. Almost all manuscripts reflecting the right practice in the land of Israel in the first millennium exclude this bracha. Ultimately, though, this prayer does not center on a Messiah, but rather on God's triumph, a world ruled by just laws, a world at peace. Ruvain Hammer, Rabbi Ruvain Hammer, remarked on the fact that the word Messiah does not appear at all in this prayer, argues that too many failed and false messiahs in Jewish history led to the exclusion of the term from this central liturgical moment. Okay, so what we have here in this uh, very dense comment is a lot of different issues uh, to, to uh, ponder. Um, it's a blessing for the restoration of the Davidic dynasty. And what does that imply is up for grabs. Um, is this a, 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 you know, a miraculous transformation of the world in messianic times? Is this simply saying we want to have self-determination, Jewish self-determination in our own home, political power with the image of David as being the representative of that? Um, so how messianic, how transformative do we, do we imagine this picture uh, needs to be? So, all right, we're going to stop here. And God willing, we'll continue next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes, you